name's Wes Carroll. Um, I run a, a, a very small team, uh, fewer than a dozen. Uh, we're based out of Berkeley, California, although we say that we're not in Berkeley, we're on the internet because um, even before the COVID-19 uh, sequestration, we did the vast majority of our work through, um, through video conference. Uh, and the main reason for that is that we're a, a specialty firm. We work with um, high achieving, serious, gifted students by and large, um, not five standard deviations above the mean necessarily, but, uh, but students who find that most uh, tutors and teachers aren't able to connect with their needs. Oh. And uh, uh, we focus on uh, primarily high school. So basically a uh, middle school through undergraduate, but primarily high school. And we have a STEM focus. So uh, math and all sciences are the primary things that we do. Um, but Julie, as you and I were talking about just a minute ago, um, we're, we're, we're simultaneously pursuing two tracks with our students, generally speaking. There's, hey, there's the calculus that I need help with, but then there's also this entire constellation of other skills that make people more successful in general, as well as in STEM fields. And we're working on those as well. So for example, um, it's very common for us to bounce back and forth in one client meeting between um, the kinds of problems that they need to be able to do for the AP calculus test, but at the same time, how to use the time on the timed AP calculus test, or even how to structure their time during the week so that they can be preparing for the calculus test in a way that's really efficient. And that can cover everything from motivation to sleep management to, you know, um, on what, uh, on what days do you have a long school day? Well, maybe that's not the day to do the especially difficult work. That's the day in which to organize your flashcards or something that doesn't take a lot of brain power. Whereas on a short day, okay, now we're gonna get into the truly difficult parts. So it's not just about, uh, it's not just about the math. It's also about how the student engages with the math emotionally, perceptually. Uh, you know, we're all humans. We have good days and bad days and we need to account for that so that we can really get the most out of the time that we have together. And the reason for that is, again, our students tend to be high achievers. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't benefit anybody if we're giving these students B plus work. We need to be doing A plus work with them. And that means we need to be understanding all the things that can either lead to A plus work or keep them from doing A plus work and tackle it all. Hmm. So, how, so did you, how did you personally start tutoring in, in math and STEM subjects? And what, yeah, yeah. what brings you to that? So um, I was... Um, uh, in high school, I had a couple of really good teachers, but by and large, I, I was the student that I'm trying to help now in that I, I realized that the, my classes just weren't geared for the way that I thought. Um, you know, it just, it just wasn't a great match. I could do it mostly, but it was just, it was just uh, frustrating for me. I wound up going to MIT as an undergraduate, and uh, that, that was much better, right? Because then you're surrounded by people who are used to being the smartest people in the room, and the classes go much faster, and they're, they're, you know, they're just much more engaging. Um, uh, one of the things that I learned at MIT, though, was that I'd never been challenged before, and I didn't know how to be challenged effectively. I found it quite overwhelming at first. By the time I finished my undergrad, I had an understanding of how to do it, but in the, in the first few years, it was very, um, frankly, um, anxiety-provoking and off-putting for me to have to work at that level. I could do it, but I didn't know how to do it 60 hours a week. It was just, that was just a new thing. I'd never had to do it before. You know, it was like, well, if I have a problem, I'll think about it hard for 20 minutes and then it'll be done. And it was like, that didn't even get you through the first problem on the problem set there, you know? So, um, so, you know, when I finished that experience, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, all these high schools have this smattering of kids who could do really high level work, but aren't learning the skills that they need to be able to, to perform at that level. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a, that's a real problem. And I don't want the next generation of kids to get to MIT and like me have to make it to their junior year before they understand how to do it. I want them to be able to get good, um, good learning and good experience out of that place from the very beginning. Right. So it's like, okay, well, how can we do this? I shelved it for a while because I, um, I was uh, originally trained as a computer scientist. So I, you know, I did a lot of work in, in industry and all that kind of good stuff. But, uh, but I finally realized that this thing that I'd had on the back burner that was such a, an important thing for me in high school and college was actually a calling and that I really wanted to spend my career doing this. Yeah. Uh, and then there was the question, well, how am I going to teach when I know that I'm going to have to do this in a different way? Like if I'm a teacher in a school, I'm going to be constantly you know, butting heads with folks who want to do it a particular way. I'm trying to invent a new way to do this. So I, I formed my own one-person firm. 
mm. and did that for a while. And since then, some like-minded tutors have joined me. And what we've realized is it doesn't need to be butting heads, that we really, you know, and we're not alone. There are other tutors who see the importance of not only understanding the material and being able to explain it 12 different ways, but being aware of the fact mm. that just, you know, the, the student you get one week isn't necessarily the same student as you get the next week, that other things are happening in their lives and you really have to be aware of that. But um, because we've always done things that way, as I say, we've got some other tutors who, who see it the same way and we've been able to help each other and connect with other people who get it on that level. And as a result, we've been able to have some really wonderful successes with students who would have trouble, you know, being successful on their own right from the get-go any other way. Um, so when you say not successful, do you mean because uh, they are extremely bright and gifted but the, the format of the learning um, or what is it that's not working? And then, yeah, how are you? Yeah, that's a big part of it. So one of the first things I need to acknowledge is that, is that for some students, getting straight A's and being happy about it can represent failure mm. from my perspective, okay? And I, I don't mean you need to work harder and be miserable. I mean, you need to be learning at a rate that challenges you and for some students, getting A's in their school is not yet at that level. They're kind of coasting through getting A's and not really growing in the way that they could be growing. Right. And for those students, it's like, let's up the challenge until we get to the sweet spot. And one of the things that's ironic is that the one thing we see a lot, I experienced this myself as a high school student, is that history class was challenging for me. For whatever reason, like that was not one that came easily and I really had to work at it, right? Um, and so we'll see that for our students as well. There are some areas where it's like, I've never been challenged here. There are other areas where it's like, actually, if you could help me dial this down, it's too much, right? And, and sort of finding that balance. Again, we're just trying to get into the sweet spot so that across all your classes and all your activities, you're growing. And that means the challenge needs to be at a certain level, not too much, but mm -hmm. certainly not too little. Let's get it to the right place. If it's too much, let's give you some additional skills that helps bring it into the sweet spot. And if it's not enough, let's open you up to some things that you haven't considered before that will help you get it to that place where you're continuing to grow. Let's let you find the place where you ought to be. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, that's yeah. great. So, yeah. so certainly one of the ways for math quantitative students to, to challenge yeah. themselves um, is through competitions like, like AMC, yeah. which you guys do training for. Yeah, do. Yeah. Um, so what, um, what do you see in terms of the growth and popularity of, of AMC of, of students who are well suited to preparing for it. And then yep. perhaps finally, um, since I, I work with a lot of students from China, so I'm curious um, if you see certain trends of how students are preparing for that style oh, of competition. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and then right, right, right. You know, how, how does that differ from, from how you do it? So uh, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot there. Okay, so uh, first of all, I want to suggest that um, calling these things math competition is sort of, it's bad marketing, bad branding. Um, unless, well, let me put it this way. Uh, a math competition isn't a competition of you against the other person. It's a competition against, uh, it's a competition where you are competing with yourself to become your best self. You're trying to unlock all of your, um, your creative potential, your way to make new connections in the math, and yes, to study in a very focused way on a limited number of things so that you can really come to a depth of understanding that normally you wouldn't get in a high school curriculum. So it's, it's all of those things mixed together. And uh, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the several reasons why it's become more popular recently, um, it, it's always been popular in a niche, but it's, it, it's becoming larger, is that it's, it's become more and more recognized over the years that the AMC is an excellent way for students to distinguish them, themselves when they've already done well on the more common standardized tests like the ACT and the SAT. And here's the reason that's important. On the ACT and the SAT, to get from the 50th percentile to the 80th percentile, you need to know more stuff. To get to the 80th percentile to the 90th percentile, you need to gain more expertise. But to get to the 90th, from the 90th to the 99th percentile, you simply need to become more meticulous. What gets you a 36 on the ACT is sitting in a room for four hours and not making any mistakes. And frankly, that's not a life skill that's important to most people with that level of brain power. Like, yes, it's important to be careful, but we're not trying to make these students into machines. We're trying to make them into powerful thinkers. 
So there comes a point in your development when getting better at the ACT or the SAT is not actually benefiting you anymore. But the AMC is hard enough and interesting enough that if you're at that level, you can continue to distinguish yourself to admissions committees while still gaining skills you're going to use later. So that's an, that's an incredibly important thing. Another thing that's changed in, in, in recent years is that there are, um, there are communities of people, uh, curated communities, uh, mostly online, that have done a very good job of breaking down what's tested by the AMC to make it possible for people to um, more effectively learn all the math that's there, which obviously goes a long way towards helping you get a higher score. The only problem with that approach is that um, if someone gives you a book and tells you to memorize the book, well, you'll learn a lot that's in the book by doing that, and you will become better at reading books, not a bad thing, but you won't get any better at researching an unknown area and discovering for yourself what's most important. So the skills you learn from doing AMC, sort of the modern, um, a typically Chinese way, frankly, right? You're talking about Chinese students, right? So a lot of the Chinese students um, um, uh, are very um, inclined and very comfortable with receiving the book, reading the book, memorizing the book, and then using their knowledge on a test, okay? And if you're gonna be a med student, you need that skill, right? As a med student, you need to learn an enormous quantity of material and you need to just have it at your fingertips. Valuable skill, no question. But if you're gonna wind up getting an MBA or work in finance, or you're gonna uh, uh, be an economist, or if you're gonna be a civil servant, or if you're going to um, uh, uh, you know, work in business, there, there's, there's just a wide range of places where learning all the stuff and having it as sort of an internal encyclopedia isn't the core skill. In those more sort of more, uh, more soft skill and sort of broader applications, an important thing you need to do is to be able to look at a novel situation and analyze its features without having an encyclopedia in your head. And in fact, I would say that, um, that an emergency room doctor, I, I talked about how important it is for medical school. Yes, you need to memorize a bunch of stuff, but as an, as an emergency room doctor, memorization only takes you so far. You have a novel situation in a patient who desperately needs attention, but you need to make certain decisions about what the appropriate thing to do is in that context. Memorization isn't enough there. There's also a level of judgment and of, and of grappling with the unknown that you need to be comfortable with and trained in. Okay, And I want to suggest that that although we've gotten a better sense of what book to memorize to be good at that part of the AMC, more than ever before, I'm finding that students are successful in that realm when they take a little bit from the book and they marry it with those, those skills of grappling with the unknown that then um, can get applied to a wide range of things later. So my most successful students um, aren't the ones who spend 60 hours a week preparing for the AMC and do nothing else. There are those students, and I think that that's great because they know that's something they want to be doing, you know, into their undergrad, grad school career. They want to be research mathematicians or whatever. That's great. But, but my successful students tend to be the ones who say, I find this really interesting, and I find many other things really interesting also. And it's like, great, we're going to spend some time now. We're going to focus on this one thing. This is going to be the thing we're going to focus on but it's not gonna be, we're not expecting you to be a research mathematician. We're expecting you to gain the most important pieces of knowledge here, and you'll use those later in some STEM field, but we're also gonna build skills around learning new stuff so that when you're done with this and you go on to something that doesn't look a lot like AMC, you still have a framework you can use from our work together that will enable you to learn more quickly because at the end of the day, that's what the successful peers of mine and eventually I at MIT discovered was the important skill. The important skill at MIT isn't, I know all this stuff. The important skill at MIT is, I know how to take on new things quickly. And that's the thing we're trying to build here. I'm sorry, I feel like I've kind of veered off from your original question, but it's, it's such an important piece of it for me that I, you know, I can't help but kind of tie it in. For sure. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so you you also you know of course do different types of tutoring well beyond AMC sure. across the sure. different STEM areas. What does a, a typical plan look like for a, a student engaging with with your team? How you yeah. know how frequently are you meeting with students? Um, 
what what does it take to see results you know to put these strategies into place and sure. also along with that curious because you said you have been working on the internet for for a very long time yeah uh, much much longer than than many who have recently adapted due to current circumstances in 2020 um wondering sure the effectiveness and how you um, measure that with students, especially in a remote environment. Yeah, so uh, a couple different things. So first of all, uh, some of what we do is going to be very familiar to people who are accustomed to tutoring. Um, for example, it is pretty common for us to work on a weekly cadence with students. Uh, we most typically work uh, an hour and a half per session once a week. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a common thing that we do. And, you know, just like you might expect from any other tutoring situation, we will have agreed on some homework that will be prepared beforehand and we'll look at the homework together. Uh, we might analyze the way in which the homework was done and some ways in which it could be improved in the future. And we might um, take some notes together in, in some shared documents that say, okay, here are the new habits we're going to try and acquire or the things we're going to do differently next time for which we expect better results. So that, that part is all you know, sort of part and parcel of what you might expect. Um, some of the ways in which it might be a bit different. Uh, first of all, I always start with a short conversation with a parent just to make sure that the ways in which we're different are not only comfortable for them, but they're what they're looking for, right? Some parents uh, come to us and discover, oh, we, we really just want the tutoring center around the corner. All we want is, you know, some increased structure and some increased motivation, and we don't actually need anything beyond that. And it's like, okay, well, that's great. No problem. Um, but when we discover, okay, this is really, um, we can offer them something that they need and that they're going to be hard pressed to find elsewhere. One of the other ways in which things are a little bit different is that I always meet with students. I'm the first meeting because what I found is that in, in having done this for going on 25 years now, it's, it's now pretty easy for me in one conversation with a student and a parent to identify what's really holding the student back from great progress in that moment. And many times it's, you know, I, I say that we discover the thing and it's like, yes, we know that. And yes, that's what we're here for. Okay, great. We're in full agreement. Now let's address that. But there are situations where I'll be talking to a student and, we, and, and the student comes in thinking, oh, all right, here's my barrier. And we ask some questions and we have some conversations and we come to discover that there's this other thing that they haven't really been fully aware of that's actually the thing preventing progress in this moment. And by tackling the thing that's really causing problems, we're able to make enormous progress where we didn't expect to be able to make it, where, where we wouldn't have been able to make it any other way. So it's really important to me that I have that first conversation just to make sure, okay, do we really know what needs to be addressed in order for the student to be successful immediately? Because obviously once you, once you identify that issue and you start addressing it, okay, then we unlock a lot of potential that otherwise would be hidden away sometimes for years. Mm. So what are some of those that. like unexpected roadblocks or, or challenges that students don't think that they have or that you see? Well, I think one of the things that comes up is that students are changing. I mean, it's easy for us to say, and we all know that students are evolving rapidly at this time in their lives, right? Like the 14 year old brain is, is exploding in, in lots of really positive ways. But as adults, we can forget how profound those changes are and kids have never experienced anything different, so they don't understand how their minds are different from the adult minds around them. So no one really gets that these things are happening. So one, of the, one, one example would be a student who, let's say that I'm seeing a 10th grader for the first time. And let's just say this is a student who in eighth grade had a lot of trouble focusing on her work, right? And so the, the, um, the habits that the student acquired and the habits that the parents helped to um, maintain and scaffold for the student was around doing work at a certain time and doing it in sort of a routine way so that their minds wouldn't drift away, so that they were able to sort of build that skill of being able to focus on something for 30 minutes at a time, 35 minutes at a time, an hour at a time, and so on. Okay, let's just say that that's the history. Well, by the time that student's in, in 10th grade, that student or that system may have evolved to the point where the student's doing three and a half hours of homework a night in a very structured way. Okay, and that would be a very reasonable way for that system to evolve. But at the point that they come to me, they may be coming to me because they feel, geez, there's not enough time to do everything that we need to do. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And in looking at it, it may not be, hey, you need a better way to think about your calculus. It may be that you've outgrown some aspects of this system of handling your work. It may be now that the problem is in working three and a half hours a night, you're cheating yourself of sleep. 
there's been some very good research that shows that people's functional IQ is lowered when they cheat themselves of even a modest amount of sleep every night. Okay, well, I mean, if, I, if someone's functional IQ is lowered, no surprise that their grades are gonna go down and the work is gonna seem more difficult, right? And yet we know that the difficulty of the work is going up, so it can be difficult to tease apart, you know, are you having an appropriate reaction to more difficult work? Or is your ability being attenuated by some, by some systems that you've put in place that made sense two years ago, but now need some fine tuning, yeah. right? So in that case, it may very well be, listen, you need to unplug on Saturdays, catch up on sleep. You need to uh, change the order in which you're doing your work. You need to put a break in there. You need to, you know, who knows, right? But there may be some things where we can start tweaking it so that we can acknowledge the fact that this 14-year-old brain has evolved enormously from the 12-year-old brain that gave rise to some of these systems that the family is now used to, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, oh, interesting. Um, so yeah, it sounds like, I mean, you're, you're very uh, all-encompassing in terms of the, the, the strategies and, and how you need to work with, with families. Um, well, I feel like you have to be, you know, because yeah. there's so much happening there that you really need to be aware of all the inputs in order to, in order to really make a difference. For sure, yeah. Do you have any, um, you know, in meeting with the parents for the first time, um, just in terms of that relationship, I mean, do you, do you have advice for, for parents with, um, you know, this type of a student or, or you know, if, if parents are feeling like they don't really know what's going on with their child or, you know, how to help them improve their studies, like what, what are ways that parents can either assess you know, where their, their child is or to, to figure out how do I even go about helping them if they're having particular challenges. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I want to lead off by saying that, that usually a, a, a moderated conversation with me, right, that first session can be really powerful there because it's, it's difficult to generalize across all families here. And really each of these conversations is different. And one of the reasons for that and maybe this is advice that I could give in general, is that um, parents have two disadvantages here, maybe three. One is that they're not only trying to help their, their, they're not only trying to help the student who lives in their house, but they are also parents to that, you know, child near adult. And the parent, the parent child relationship and the student helper relationship can come in conflict. So that's one thing. Like I've, I mean, I've, I've had students where the parents are fully qualified to help with math, but because they're parents, you're not able to have the conversations you need to have in order to really catalyze um, growth in that way. So that's one thing. Another thing is that the, um, again, the parents can, um, they know intellectually, but sort of deep in their bones, they lose track of how the child in front of them is not the child they knew even as recently as six months ago. There really has been evolution there. You know, but of course it happens in fits and starts and you can't, you can't necessarily track that, you know, in lockstep, right? Another thing is that generally speaking, um, the parents of my students tend to be successful themselves and just like their students are learning to do, they've become successful by leveraging certain strengths that they have and working around whatever weaknesses that they have. And the problem is that the strength and weakness profile of the parent can be dissimilar from the strength and weakness profile of the student. Uh -huh. And when that's the case, right, the parent's been super successful with this set of strategies and the strategies don't work on the kid. And it's really easy to fall into the mindset of, if you would just listen and do what I say, you would be successful. But it's like, well, that depends on the profiles matching, which sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. And if you're dealing with someone who has a very different profile, well, first of all, that can feel strange because it's your own son or daughter. How can they be so different? And yet it can happen, right? Um, and also, um, you know, we forget that just because we've been, as parents, successful with our own profiles, it doesn't mean that we're a master of all possible profiles. No. So, you know, I, I'd love to say that there's, a, there's an easy fix here, but all I can say is just, just starting with a recognition of it's complicated can go a long way. And of course, the, the parents that I've worked with um, that have been really successful in, in helping me, uh, let me put it this way. Um, where I've had families that I've worked with and the parents have really been an important part of our success together as a team on behalf of the student, the parents have brought a really lovely um, mix of um, 
of uh, patience, competence, and humility, mm. right? And I, I say that as someone who tries to embody those things myself. Mm -hmm. You have to be patient because the student is ready when the student's ready. And, and when you catch the student that moment, boy, are you gonna have great success. But until it happens, you've gotta just lay the groundwork, right? And competence, look, we all have different strengths that we're willing to offer the student and we're there ready to help as soon as, as, soon as the student's ready. But there's also humility because when we do this right, the student will routinely surprise us in a positive way with how much they're able to do that we didn't think the student was ready for, you know, and we just, and we show up and it's like, wait a minute, th this is a, di wait, you're, oh, I thought we were going to have to do this, but you're already three miles ahead of that point because you've been thinking about it same as we have, mm. right? And then we can get a really nice uh, dynamic going where we're all looking at the future while we're enjoying the present and how quickly we're moving. I think that that's just a lovely thing. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. I think we, we yeah, can end on, on that note. I mean, that's okay. uh, very positive. So sounds yeah. perfect. Julia, uh, thanks so much for this opportunity to talk. Yeah. I, I've really enjoyed having this chance. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. It's, it's fun great. to, to hear about all of this. Mm -hmm.